right, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Thomas. I'm your session chair for today, and you're here for Whitney Quisenberry's A Web for Everyone. Uh, a few announcements. We ask that you please complete speaker evaluations uh, via the UXPA 2013 mobile app. The mobile app uh, URL is m.uxpa2013.org. Uh, we encourage you to do that. If you don't want to do that, put me in the back as uh, surveys that you can complete, surveys. But we ask that everyone please complete the survey. Um, this session is being recorded, so I'm required to read this announcement. As a professional courtesy to the speakers and in compliance with copyright law, no video, there is no video or audio recording of these, uh, this session. To request permission, please visit the UXPA on-site registration desk. So now please uh, welcome Whitney Quisenberry. Let me just amend that. I've been asked several times by people who are listening to English as a, not their first language if they could make an audio recording so they can listen to it again, and I'm happy for you to do so if that will help you. Um, also, I have a tendency to speak fast and to get going faster and faster as I watch the clock ticking. If I do that, just do this. I know what that means. It means, yo, slow down. That's fine. The other bit of housekeeping is I love to take questions during. We'll be a little interactive. Um, if you have a question, speak up. We'll leave time at the end also, but don't, don't hold it. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll get to it. So a web for everyone, accessibility as a design problem. I agonized long and hard about whether to put the word accessibility into this title at all. How many of you, um, when you think of the word accessibility, what do you think of? Private compliance, laws. Screen readers, technology. Another technology, keyboard navigation. Low vision, Low vision a, a person with an ability or, or type of ability. Independence, so a goal. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm at this end of the spectrum, but most of us are way over at that nasty, awful compliance standards. You know, it's another thing we have to do. It's another set of rules we have to follow. Um, Ten years ago, I was someone who sort of thought accessibility was a nice thing. Of course, we ought to do it. It's good for people. Why not? I don't write code, so it's you know, easy for me to say. And then I started working in elections. And um, one of the things that happened there, not to dwell on this too long, and it still goes on, is that there's a conflict that comes out in political advocacy between the, 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 the goal to make it possible for all, all, all citizens to vote independently and privately and the goal for all citizens to be able to vote securely and confidently. And it stopped me short because it was the first time I'd seen that argument phrased in a, those people are keeping me from. And whenever you hear the word those people, you know that whatever comes after it is no good, right? Because it's, it's saying, I want something and you're keeping me from getting it. And we hear that around innovation. When the, iP when the iPhone came out, I was actually on a standards committee and the poor representative from Apple had to sit there like a stone while people said, you've just produced a glass brick with nothing tactile, no way for people, you know. And now, eight years later, seven years later, how long has the iPhone been out? Whatever. Um, the iPhone is the darling of the disability community. And I think it's because Apple had a choice. In part, they wanted to compete with some of the entrenched devices that were being sold to the federal government. And it was so clear they couldn't <laughs> with, a, with a device with one button on it. Um, and they could have built some technology around the edges, and they could have kind of done it in a sort of we've met the minimum standards of the law kind of way. But what they did instead, and I know nothing. I'm not an Apple insider. I know nothing about the process of what happened. So this is totally my view from the outside. What they did was they said, how can we build this into the very guts of the system? Right? So VoiceOver, which is a screen reader, and a lot of other assistive technology tools are not added on. They are built into the operating system of iOS and of Mac OS, OS X. So now all of a sudden, it's part of how any Mac application works. So all the good things about the fact that the Mac is fairly rigid about their platform now extends to accessibility, which means that I don't have to worry about which version of the screen reader they have. I, they're using the iOS. 
I know what they're doing. I know what's going to happen. So it has great benefit for the people who need that assistance, but it also has great benefit for technologists, for the people who design, for the people who build products. And that's really where I think we need to get to in general. What I want to talk to you about today is some of the things about how you think about design, how you think about the process of creating digital things so that what we end up with is something that is for everyone. Right? I'll show some examples of physical products too, but I'm largely focused on web, and I also mean mobile web and you know, web on your refrigerator and you know, that sort of stuff as well. Because I think that we only get to this goal of a web for everyone when it's something that becomes part of how we think about design and isn't an extra added thing added on. So when we think about assistive, assistive technology, how about these things? Are these assistive technology? Right, glasses used to be, I mean, I've worn glasses all my life. And when I was a kid, glasses were big and thick and ugly and you got made fun of. And now, they're a fashion statement. Right? What happened? One of the things that happened was there's some new technology. So I can now wear a pair of glasses and actually be able to see that don't force my chin down to my nose, you know, my knees. Um, but the other thing that happened is that designers started designing frames. They started making fashion around, around glasses. So things change in technology, things change in how we design. Here's another example. Anybody know what that is? It's a mail carrier's cart in the United States. You know why that exists? Back in the 60s, 70s, some women who worked in the post office thought maybe they would like to be able to be mail carriers. Because it turns out that this is the high paid job and they would like to have it. It's the job out of the office, you know. And they said, you can't be a mail carrier because women, women are too weak and too small to carry a 50 pound sack of paper on their back. Because in a city, you go to those mailboxes on the corner and they, they've planted sacks of mail there and you carry them down the street and put them in the mailboxes. And lawsuits emerged, and advocacy happened, and all those things happened, and we uh, reinvented the wheel. Right? We thought, if we put this mail on a wheel, then, then it won't hurt people's backs. And you know what else happened? Besides it allowing women, 50% of the population, to have a job, it reduced the injuries for men. Because carrying 50 pounds of weight all the time on your back ain't so good for anybody. Right? Who has a phone with voice input? Who has a smartphone? Who has an Android phone? Who has an iOS phone? Everybody's hands went up in any of those things has voice input on their phone somewhere. Voice input was originally designed as assistive technology. As it's gotten to work better, as it's gotten built into the devices, it becomes everyday technology. And something magic happens when that happens. Because to be disabled is often to be poor. You tend to have less education. That means you have less good jobs. You may be less able to work. So you're already at a disadvantage and a double disadvantage. And assistive technology is expensive. Right? JAWS, the most popular screen reader, costs something on the order of $1,500 plus $300 a year for updates. Now, think about iOS with voiceover for free. Think about NVDA, a new open source uh, Windows platform screen reader. Think about being able to talk to your computer to do text input. And all of a sudden, we don't have to have separate technology anymore. It's just there for people who need voice input, for people for whom voice input is helpful. Whether that's helpful because I'm lousy with my thumbs, or that's helpful because I can't see glass keyboards. Right? And the last example are the OXO Good Grips. These were designed by someone who noticed that his mother was having trouble in the kitchen gripping the nasty little tools we used to have and design something that is now a pretty high kitchen fashion statement, right? Good for everybody. Lots of people don't even know that these were designed for anything but just to be a good kitchen appliance. And yet, they allow people to continue working in their kitchen, to continue feeding themselves, to continue feeding their families, whether they, without having to have special equipment. The thing about this is change never comes easily, right? We always get set in our ways, and when someone suggests something new, there is a almost instinctive protective reaction that sort of goes, oh God, not another thing to have to learn, right? It's not a bad reaction, it's a human reaction. It's 
curb, curb cuts. Anybody live in a city that has those curb cuts in the corner? Everybody ever use them for their rolly suitcases, their bicycles, their baby carriages? Um, do you know that it took nonviolent protests, that people chained their wheelchairs to the street, to manhole covers in the middle of the streets to make that happen? Um, the death of civilization was predicted um, because we were going to um, <laughs> make curb cuts. And yet, not so many years later, 40 or so years later, they're so obvious that everybody has them. Um, in some of the cities in China and other cities I've been in, there's actually a strip down, not right at the edge of the curb, not right against the building, that's got a tactile feel. So that if you are walking and don't see well, you can actually track yourself down the middle of the sidewalk. Um, same thing happens in the Washington Metro. There's tactile, bumpy stuff at the edge of the platform. So that if, even if you're not looking, you will begin to notice that it exists. We simply make these things part of our environment. The other thing that's happened, I think, in the world is besides some, some big sort of industrial changes, is there's been huge technological changes, right? You know, I love computers except when I want to throw them out the window, but most of us are here in some part because we've gotten entranced by some aspect of technology, whether it's entranced by how horrible it is and we want to fix it, or entranced by the possibilities of it and we want to work with it. And those technological advances have been huge advances in medical technology. Um, so we have Oscar Pistorius, who not only won in the Paralympics, but ran in the Olympics on cheetah legs. Now, I've left his picture up, for those who read the news, <laughs> because it also illustrates another point, which is just because he's a world-class runner on his amazing legs does not mean he's not a jerk, right? He's as likely to be a jerk as you are or you are or you are, because being, having a disability does not make you a saint. It does not make you someone who is automatically more forgiving of the world or anything else. It makes you a person with a disability, right? And so that means that, you know, they're not going to sort of say, oh, isn't it wonderful? So someone may, you, you may work really hard to make a site accessible and still get emails that say, why didn't you do the one thing I need, right? Because they're people. We complain. They all complain. So. Um, a little sort of background, which is that something else happened in the bigger, broader world. The World Health Organization maintains a, a standard called the International Classification of Functioning, which is really important. It's one of the ways the governments line up their, their statistics, and it's the way medical systems line up their statistics. And in the first half of the 20th century, the definition of disability was a medical model. It was defined as uh, something that was wrong with a body. But in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they updated this to say that disability is the outcome of an interaction between a person with an impairment and the environment and attitudinal barriers they face. So we create disability. And I think this is an enormously empowering statement because that means if disability is a medical problem, I can't do anything about it. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a rehab you know, person. There's nothing I can do. I can be nicer or more helpful or more accommodating, but that's really it. But if, if disability is an interaction, then I can fix it. I can do something about it. This makes it something that I can do, even if it's as, in as teeny a way as identifying the content of a picture. Right? I can add one more little pebble on the road to the web for everyone. And in fact, there's been a lot of work about bringing together and, and sort of following on the, the, the things that follow on from that. So here's the, the classic 9241 definition of usability, which I'm sure we can all recite together. Usability is the effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which the people for whom a product is intended can use it. A little bit of standard geekdom for those who are totally bored by standards. Um, ISO, the International Organization on Standardization, has been normalizing its human factors related standards and bringing them together into one series. And they chose the 9241 series. And they've brought the process standards in there. They brought some of the document standards in there. And they brought their accessibility standards into that same series. And they said that accessibility is the usability of a product, service, environment, or facility by people with the widest range of capabilities. So accessibility is now not compliance with 508, or it works for screen readers. It's usability for more people. 
And that puts it right in our lap. So just to talk a little bit about the magnitude of the problem. This is, these numbers are numbers that we put together for a voting project, which was interesting for me because it makes it adults, right? We were looking, we looked at the census and the National Center for Health Statistics to try to quantify the number of non-institutionalized adults in the United States, just so we have one place. One of the challenges of doing international statistics is that people don't measure exactly the same things. And in fact, in the US, you will see these numbers go up and down as they've changed the questions on the census surveys. They can just, a, a tweak to that question could change the number from say, 34 million to 57 million people reporting, self-reporting as having some form of disability. But in, so in the US, a few years ago, 19 to 20 million people have some trouble seeing whether they're fully blind or not. 33 million, 31 million have trouble hearing or can he cannot hear at all. 28 million with some physical disability. 3 million who have trouble grasping small objects. And 18 million who speak English less than very well. And I'm gonna include that because language is part of interaction. So that's a lot of people, right? That's a lot of people. Um, we don't see them often in our usability testing. And I'll talk about that and why that is true in a little bit. There's one other group of people we have to sort of worry about, and that's anybody who plans to get old. Right? Um, my mother used to say we shouldn't have tax exemptions for anything except something everybody's gonna get like old and nobody wants like blind. And the rest of it is all up to how you choose to live your life. But there's a truth here, which is that at about age 45, you start going to hell in a handbasket. Right? Your vision, your hearing, and your dexterity all start to fall off rather rapidly. So the fact that um, a lot of graphic designers are 18-year-olds in dark rooms with wonderful monitors and great eyesight, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big issue here. I'm, I'm already old. I hope to get older, um, and I hope that I can still read things when I do. So that's another reason to really think about it, because if we see disability as a spectrum of ability, then it stops being a binary discontinuous you are or you aren't and it starts to be allowing um, graceful degradation, flexible adaptation, all those like well, lovely words that we use. And the other thing is that lots of people benefit. We've talked about curb cuts. Who got here on Amtrak or has ever ridden Amtrak? Right. You go to, if you, did you buy your ticket at the ticket kiosk? They're all over the place. Did you notice that that's a fully accessible kiosk? If you said no, that's actually a pretty cool answer. Right? Because it's just there and it's invisible. It's a glass screen, it's a touch screen, but there's this keypad that's just sitting there. There's actually an audio jack that's just sitting there. And if you need it, it's there. It's not in your face, it's just there. So lots of people might need to use some, some form of a, a assistive technology, whether they are declared as someone with a disability or not. If you're in a noisy mall, um, if you've left your glasses at home, if you have the wrong glasses with you and so on. So that's who we're talking about. So, having done that now, let's talk about eight principles for accessible design. Um, I'll go through them all, you'll see these again, um, but they kind of start from the very beginning of the project and they go all the way to the goal, from starting with a clear purpose to having fabulous universal usability at the end. So clear purpose is really about having well-defined goals. Anybody think that's a cool thing for usability, right? Yeah, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, knowing what you're trying to do. So where do we start? We always start with the audience. I mean, that's where everything we do starts from. It starts from who are the people. So this is where I want to talk about, about recruiting and how we recruit participants in our research and in our usability testing. Because if you have firm quotas, you've really defined your audience and you have very crisp quotas about your recruiting, um, you've done two things. One is that you've made sure that you have a nice homogenous or appropriate pool of people to work with, but you've also weeded out diversity. Right? You've weeded out the chance maybe for someone to show up. I did a usability test for um, IEEE, and I, we were recruiting non-members. So we were tweeting and social media wildly to find people who ought to be or might be IEEE members but don't happen to be now. And I, we found some people, and I was busy sending out the go-to-meeting invitations for them, and I get an email back that said, hi, I've never tried go-to-meeting. Will it work with my copy of JAWS? 
And I went, oh, <laughs> right? oh my God, I have no idea. I've never tried it. Right? I didn't recruit him to be a blind engineer. I just recruited an engineer who wasn't a member of IEEE. And we went back and forth and, and we're emailing each other rapid fire. And I said, you know what? We're both obviously sitting at our desk. We're obviously here. Why don't we just try it? And it turned out it worked just fine. It also turned out that he had the highest performance level of any user in that test. He was the fastest and the most effective user. Now, he was an engineer, so he's really good with his tools. But they also had just launched a new template for their website that was built in a new modern content management system instead of the old clunky, nasty one that they'd had before. And they had worked very hard at making those um, templates accessible. They just hadn't tested it yet. And it turned out that he would figured out that if he hit H, which takes you from heading to heading in JAWS three times, he would end up on a little menu of on this page links that would tell him what was on the page, let him jump through them. So while everybody else was scanning the page, he was going H, 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 read, 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 link, go. Right? So kind of by accident, well, not by accident, through a long process of good work, they ended up with a site that actually worked really well for their members who included engineers who were blind. I also think that we should be thinking accessibility first. Now, this is a pretty conscious play on Lou Kroblisky's um, notion of mobile first. Right? When he talks about mobile first, what he says is when you think about constraints first, it forces you into clarity. It forces you into thinking about clear purpose. So without getting into the mobile versus desktop debates, um, I think the, key, the part I'm taking out of here is this notion that if we think about not just screens constraints, but types of interaction constraints from the very beginning, then it's much easier to build. It's harder to bolt things on at the end. It's harder to wedge things in at the end than it is to have them there from the beginning. And the same, one of the challenges of working, say, with a screen reader is that you have a, 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 a narrow channel. It's a linear, thin channel with which to take in a very complicated environment. I was working with a, a blind user, and she said, we were, we were actually teaching people to do usability testing with people with using assistive technology. And I asked all of them if they had any tips for the people in the class. And she said, when we get started, just let us, just leave us alone for a minute. Because every website we come to is confusing and a complicated and a, and a disorienting experience. And we just need, I just need a few minutes to get myself oriented, and then I'm ready to work with you. So that means that the clearer and the simpler and the more, I don't want to use the word intuitive because we're not talking about intuitive here. We're talking about discoverable, right, findable. We can make it. That often will also translate into a clearer, um, simpler, more discoverable, more usable experience in all senses, right, for visual users as well as for non-visual users. And the last thing that I think is really important, and this is sort of a big political statement, <laughs> is that if we get the accessibility into the templates, then we reduce the challenge of making each and every page or function accessible, right? Because so much of what goes into making something accessible is really under the covers that let's, that if we, if we start from good style sheets and good structure and all the stuff that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, then we don't have to do it again. This is a couple of generations back, but it's a version of WordPress is canonical 2011 um, template that was made accessible. Anybody, can anybody spot what's accessible about it? It's a trick question, right? The differences are only that, you know, she's got different words on it. She's added some anchoring. She's added some invisible links to help you uh, jump around the page more easily. And doesn't change anything about the visual experience at all, but makes a world of difference to the non-visual experience. And in fact, one of the, the, the things that's going on is that advocates, instead of trying to get people to make their web WordPress sites accessible after the fact, are trying to build more and more accessibility features into the base requirements for a WordPress template. So then, when I, a complete duffer about code, say, oh, I'd like to make a website, I've started out five steps ahead instead of 25 steps back. Right. So the other thing, when we think about it, is to think outside the mouse. Right? Um, one of the keys, if you have if, uh, one, of my, one of my instant five second tips to testing your website for accessibility that requires no equipment at all, in fact, it requires removing a piece of equipment, is just throw away your mouse and try to use your website with your keyboard. 
And the reason why is that many, many forms of assistive technology use the keyboard interface. So um, we have a braille note taker. Um, we have a mouth stick, which actually uses no electronic interface at all. Screen readers, uh, in part, use the keyboard interface. Screen enlarger, the things like joysticks, specialized keyboards, all make use of that keyboard interface. And if you've hidden something from the keyboard interface, you've hidden it from that technology as well. So simplest solution is just to do that. Um, and I want to just point to the person at the bottom of the screen who is a woman named Glenda Watson Hyatt, one of my heroes. Um, she has cerebral palsy. She's nonverbal. She um, jokes that she has written three books with her left thumb. And one day, she got an iPad. And she programmed her iPad to say, I would like, I don't, I'm making this up, I forget, I don't know what kind of coffee she actually takes, but she programmed it to say, I'd like a, a tall, non-fat latte, please. She drove her scooter down to her neighborhood um, uh, Starbucks or coffee shop. She pressed the button. It asked for her coffee. She paid for her coffee. And she went home with her coffee all by herself. And she writes about that moment in her blog. It's a fabulous blog. If you, just, if you want a kind of deep dive into the experience, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to go to read. And it was the moment when off-the-shelf technology changed her life. There was nothing special about her iPad. Right? Let her do all that stuff. So um, starting from understanding that, that broad vision of the, of the humanity that's out there. OK, second thing is building the standards. I'm not going to spend much time on this, because most of us are probably not the coding people, but you might be. Um, there's been a big movement uh, for the Web Standards Initiative, which recently shut its doors and announced that his job was done. That we have largely, uh, and I, I, don't say that, I don't say that in music, they said largely we have gotten there. The fight is now not to get people to acknowledge the existence of standards and the importance of them, to make sure that the standards do what we need them to do. So Steve Faulkner from the Passiello Group, who spoke, um, Mike has spoken here a number of times, has been working on the HTML5 committee to try to make sure that the base features of HTML5 incorporate all that we know about what's required um, in code, in the structure of the code, um, just to make sure that things really work. The two big standards you need to know about are WCAG 2.0, which stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and Way Area, which stands for the Web Accessibility Initiatives, <sighs> Accessible Rich Internet Applications. <laughs> One of them things, Way Area. It's become a word. Um, there's lots of other little, little ones, but those are the two biggies. And what's happened to Way Area is that we're working on getting that merged into HTML5, so that when HTML5 comes out, it will hopefully be a really full-featured platform. Um, but if you have any influence on the code, thinking about well-structured code, because well-structured code is not just easily readable for human review, as many agile processes include, but it also makes it easier for other technologies to read it, right? Because what we're really talking about is alternate browsers. And um, the other thing, and this is something to think about, is what's the reading order? If you took a complicated page and you read it in a single order, if you have to push it all into one column, does that order make sense? Because that's what happens with either two switch interfaces or audio interfaces, is you're what we call linearizing the page. So if you've got something that makes sense in order, then you're, again, farther on towards having something that's not only functionally accessible, but usably accessible. See? And, it's, and it works for responsive design. Responsive design is actually my hero of the, of the decade because the thing that makes it responsive it does many, many of the pieces of work to make it accessible. Um, and so I love things where modern, modern design and accessible design and user design are all pointing in the same direction. And it says that we've really gotten somewhere from the days when we were all working at cross purposes. Um, the, as I said, WCAG 2.0 is the big standard. It was passed in 2007, 8, 7, 8, OK, 8. Um, in 2006, I was spending many, many hours sitting in a conference room in Washington, DC, with 48 of my closest friends, um, working on the update to Section 508. And we worked very hard at writing things that coordinated with WCAG, which wasn't finalized yet. 
Um, we hope to see the results of this on the street at the end of this year or early next year, but it's going to be better than what we wrote because in their truly great wisdom, um, the Access Board's latest proposal, which was announced in a, uh, for public comment, remember, the, remember all that stuff about the regulatory map from two days ago? We got to the public comment part of that, and what they proposed was instead of writing a parallel WCAG, we would simply adopt WCAG. Right? It's called, in, in legal terms, it's called incorporation by reference, and it says, that thing over there, we're going to follow that. And Europe is doing the same thing. And so, uh, knock wood, what we hope to see, I'm have, again, we're not allowed a lot of insight into this process. We're back in the black box. But what we think is going to happen is that at some point in the next six months or so, we're going to see an announcement from both the US and Europe that both of them will adopt WCAG. Now, there are so many cool things about this. Cool thing number one, when a new standard comes out, it's always hell. Right, because everybody has to scramble around and figure out what it is and write books and complain that it doesn't work well and learn new things. And now, instead of that, we're going to get a standard that we've been working with since 2006, really, 2008 fully. And it's going to be a well-known, well-standard with good set of techniques that people know how to work with it. So that's the first thing, is that we're not having to start afresh. And the second is that if you work in a large company, a multinational company, a company that sells their products or uses their products anywhere outside of one national borders, global harmonization is a huge deal. Um, we heard this over and over and over with Kimberly from the Oracles and the AT&Ts and the, and the Microsofts and the, the big companies on the committee was please, please, please don't make us have to maintain different standards for different governmental bodies. And so now all of a sudden your team all around the world will be largely referencing the same thing. Canada has gone in that direction. New Zealand has. Uh, I'm sure there are many, many more, and I don't keep up with the list. But basically, it's a real push towards having a global standard. Um, and that's kind of awesome. Um, so let me just show you an example of what unfriendly structure looks like. I have mercifully blacked out the name of this publication uh, because, I, because they're no particularly worse than others. But when I ran, a, there's an accessibility checker called Wave that lets you look at the site and tell you, you know, what might be wrong with it. It turns out that there's all kinds of warnings and errors all over the place. Not in the actual text of the article, which turns out is just fine, but all this stuff at the top is just kind of hellish. And part of what's hellish about it is that you came here to to read this. You probably clicked on a link that said the case for drinking as much coffee as you like, right? And you want to see the article that proceeds down here. But there's all this stuff before you even get there. And when you're reading through it and trying to find it, it looks like this, right? So you come into the page and it says things like image, the case for drinking as much coffee as you like. And that's a lot. That's probably 30 seconds of talk before you get to the thing that's the link you clicked on. Who has a, a best practices in their company that says, when you click on a link, you should get to the thing the link said? Right? Not 30 seconds later, after listening to advertisements, menus, et cetera, you should get to the thing the link said. Um, there, one of the tools that comes with this tool, it will count tab order. And if you were working with a keyboard, you would have hit your tab key 41 times to get there. So. When we talk about structure and we talk about friendly structure and unfriendly structure, it's this kind of stuff. It's not inaccessible. You can get there. You just can't get there very nicely. So, so next one is easy interaction. Um, and I'm going to spend exactly one screen on this. Um, because uh, here, I think, in general, we are either talking about coding to standards under the covers, or we are talking about um, designing so we've got a usable interaction. And I want. Anne and Margie to raise your hands because they do the most amazing presentation on working on making. Yeah, go ahead. I want you to see them. So if you see their names, Anne Chadwick Dias and Margie Virgil from Fidelity do this amazing presentation on the details of making stuff interaction. And I'm not even going to try to do it. This isn't my area of specialty. And they do it much better. And they'll be sitting there smirking at me. So that would be no good. Um, but we're going to jump to something I know a little more about, which is wayfinding. I want to tell you a little story before I dive into this. This is Google Maps, or whatever maps you want. 
Anybody use Google instructions or map instructions? Yeah. Do you, when you print it out, do you ever print it out to take it with you? Do you use the map view or do you use the instruction view? Well, both of them together. There's, a, there's actually a uh, blog post that I've dug up from T.V. Raman, who's the head of accessibility at Google. These instructions, all this text, he put that in. That was an accessibility accommodation that he insisted that they add to, this, to the map feature. Can you imagine trying to use the maps if all you had was the visual and you couldn't get instructions? Uh, we know, you know, <laughs> there are visual wayfinders, there are textual wayfinders, there are step-by-step -step wayfinders, there are overview wayfinders. And his insistence that there be some text version of this visual map has made Google Maps the thing it is today. Um, I actually, um, someone was reading something I'd written that included this, and they said, that can't be true. They're big accessibility people. They've been around for a long time. And I said, yeah, I showed them the thing. They went, wow, who, who would have thought that we had to make that happen? So um, that's a sort of big, big world wayfinding. But when we think about wayfinding on the web, what we're talking about is being able to find your way either around a site or around a page. And I specifically mean around a page in this case. Not, not so much can you find the page to get to, but once you get to a page, can you find your way around that page itself? And the combination of HTML5 and Way Area does a lot of that, but visual presentation does as well. Um, a, a little known statistic, 30% of people who are classified as blind can see. Right? Most, a third of people who are poor blind have some vision, and people who have some vision like to use that vision. So if you can combine big enough text with strong visual landmarks, helps lots of people. You have conventions, and you have, so we have all of our visual tools and all of our consistency tools at our disposal, but we also have these technical tools. This is about as technical as I'm going to get today, but I want to do this because this is a sort of important thing. HTML5 has what they call elements, which let you identify sections of the code by their structural purpose. So this is the article, it's in the side, it's a footer, and we just added main. ARIA can identify things as roles, um, and they kind of map together, right? So you can say, this is the navigate, this is header, it's a banner, it has, it, it, you can identify it as um, navigation, and you can say that it's role is banner. So you can, you can create a, a, a textual semantic map of the page. It's not a map of the content of the page, but the layout of the page. Let me make that a little bit clearer. Let me just show it to you on one of my latest projects. We have not put the way ARA code in. We're doing it now. We decided we weren't going to launch anything that big that was new just before the conference because, you know, we're wimps. Um, well, we think about this page here. A lot of stuff going on here, but actually there's a big banner at the top that starts, starts about here, right? And we can nest ARIA roles. So we can say there's a big roll of banner. There's a navigation section at the top there's a form that happens to be a search form. Here's our main. This is the stuff you came here to read, kids. Here's another bit of navigation. And then here's some other con content info, other links, things that you might want to know about. And there's some complimentary stuff on the side, which is things like author bios and, and tags and language, t language links. We could actually make the language links into a into navigation menu as well, because that takes you to pages with translations. But we can now map this. A pretty simple page. But this, this applies sort of across the board. The trick, if you're doing this, is that everything on the page has to be wrapped into some role or other. And in the screen readers, um, the way a screen reader navigates, it can choose what to navigate by. It can read the whole page in order. It can navigate by headings. It can navigate by roles. It can navigate by jumping from figure to figure, from a whole bunch of other things. And it can go into forms mode. And so what you're doing is saying, here's, here's big signposts all around the site that get you to places, kind of like an anchor link does. And another situation where I was working on a project with OpenIDO, and they have an enormously complicated page. It took me 15 minutes of explanation to get visual users through this. Um, and we were, our, the topic of our challenge was on accessibility. And we said, you know, you don't really want the New York Times article that says accessibility challenge not accessible. This is bad PR, and you're doing this kind of for the PR, and we need to fix this. And the programs went, oh, so cool, we're going to do HTML5, we're going to do all this wonderful stuff. And the project manager said, we have six weeks. 
We're not doing, we're not ripping apart a giant database driven content management system with user generated content with six weeks to go. What you got, Whitney? And what we did was we actually put in something called skip links. So up here, before the beginning of the content, way up at the top, actually off screen, we put in a collection of links. We spent some time talking about them. This is an unusually large collection of skip links because it's an unusually complicated page. But the skip links are kind of the map, a, vi a textual map of what's on this page that's important. So you come into the page, and if you're hearing the screen or you're looking at it with certain technology, it says we have phases of the challenge, we have the main content, we have comments, we have statistics, we have related stuff, we have places where you can share it, and we can, you know, you can see the activity feed. And, or you could just skip right to the main and skip all the rest of the stuff. So if you already know the page, you can come in and go skip, skip, and you jump from way up there, you skip all of this, you skip all of this, you skip the activity feed, and you jump right to here in one click. Okay. So this is about as low tech as you get in HTML, um, where it basically makes this into something that's more you know, robust and less reliant on links. So that's wayfinding, right? Not so hard. Anybody feeling like, boy, this would be a whole lot, I couldn't possibly add this to my project yet? Good, cool. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on presentation because I have to pick, we only have an hour. Um, and um, so I just want to say that for, for presentation stuff, it's, it's all the stuff we know plus a little bit more. And the little bit more is thinking about color contrast. Who's thinking colorblind? Right. Cool thing happened. Lots of good research went on at the Lighthouse, which is an organization for blind and low vision in the US. And they said, you know, we can use contrast, background to foreground contrast, as a stand-in for all the variations of color vision deficiencies. So it doesn't matter whether you see no color or some colors. So this is red on green, not so good, just because it produces a kind of gray on gray effect. But here's a kind of purpley red on a light green, works pretty well, because it's one is very light and one is darker, one is more saturated and the other is more pastel -y. So you can think about those. And, and the other thing that happened was because they were doing some pretty good quantitative research, there's now plug in the color calculators. Take your colors, plug them in, boom. The exception, by the way, to the color contrast requirements is your company's logo. So when you look at your logo and you think, oh my god, it's red and green and blue and it's all the same color and it doesn't pass color contrast requirements, it's okay. may not be good business, but it's, but it's okay. It will pass 508. It's an exception. You do not have to go to bat with the brand police over accessibility. Um, so doing that. There's another layer of stuff that has partly to do with visual and partly to do with content, part of where I live, which is to think about plain language and creating a conversation. It's a screen reader pattern of a fairly complex four column screen with a two column span in the middle. And you can see some fairly typical F pattern reading going on. So thinking about designing so that you're not only supporting F pattern reading in general, but you're using visual landmarks that can pop off the page a little bit to help people who are seeing a less clear view of the screen find those landmarks easily. That might mean making sure there's enough gutter space between your columns or putting good headers on them. But the thing that I worry a lot about, because I'm a Ginny Reddish, I'm a Ginny groupie, is this. I worry about literacy. 44% of the people in the United States read at basic or below basic. These are people who can read, but do not read very well. There's a whole quadrant, uh, every 10 years, big study of, of it in the US called the National Assessment of Adult Literacy. Um, you can see that most people live in the middle, right? Intermediate. A few people are out here at proficient. It's a kind of, it's almost a bell curve. So it's, it's okay. Um, but when you think about a general site for a general audience, just remember, People who are below basic can read. They can piece together the words, but they may or may not know. Um, they might, may not be able to, to pull the sentence together in their heads. At, at basic, you can read, but you can't draw inferences. You can't connect the dots between things. Intermediate is where most of us live, and probably everybody in this room lives out here. So when you think about what you see in, in the words, that's what we're talking about. So, I have a whole presentation on content as accessibility. I'm going to 
mercifully stop here. But I just want to talk about supporting reading and perception. This was a slide, um, a page from a site for, for a career um, development organizations uh, in states. It's a state-federal partnership. And they had these sort of great graphs that were supposed to visually make a point about why, you know, how you could better your career prospects. And this was like training and education pays. And then the whole rest of the page was this big graphic. Not very good. And we thought, how can we fix this? So we did a bunch of things. We, first of all, we made the title of the page be meaningful. It actually is the takeaway. We put a short paragraph. We still have the big graphic. But what the alternate text for the graphic says is, by the way, the numbers are here. So we have the picture and we have the numbers. These are actually good color contrast because the red renders as a pale gray and blue because we avoided red green and gone to, we, we mixed up the two major color blindness, renders as black. So we've sort of solved it by thinking not just about each element, but how the page fits together, how you read it, what the flow of information is, right? We wouldn't want to put this at the top because people who are very visual are going to hit this and go, yuck, right? and it'll stop them in their tracks. But people who are not seeing this at all because they're listening to it on a screen reader will just skip right past it and get down to the data. So we've sort of put the whole thing together in a way that makes something. And now we get to, I think there should be seven actually, now we get to the place where I have to say that it is more work to do accessibility because I don't like to lie. Steve Crew told me I couldn't lie to the audience. Um, and when you're talking about media, there is something you have to do, which is think about how to support all senses. Visual and audio is what we're primarily talking about. You might be using haptics, but let's just leave that out of the equation for a minute. And you do that by duplicating your cues. So if you think about road signs, right? Road signs have, a stop sign has a shape, it has a color, and it has a word, sometimes multiple words. So there's three cues, so that if you saw a kind of washed out reddish looking oct octagon on the road, you would probably instinctively recognize it as a shape because it has been consistently hammered into your head that the only thing on the road with that shape is a stop sign, right? So it's that kind of duplicating of cues. And the biggest thing for most people who do content is thinking about alternative text for graphics, short, short, short name is alt text. Um, and the question is, what should you describe that picture as if you're putting it on a web page? Any thoughts? It depends why you put it on the page. It's a journalistic content strategy driven thing. It's not technical at all. So you might be saying, any day now, you might be just saying fox. You might be saying it's a red fox. You might be saying it's a photography site and it's a picture of a red fox standing on the, a pile of stones looking back at the camera. Or, as indeed it did, it was from a National Park Service site, you might say that it's a red box at Satchewet Point National Wildlife Refuge. And you might even be going on in the caption or article to say that these are wildly rare and isn't it amazing that we saw one. So what you want to say about that image depends in part on why it's here, how much specificity you need. Next thing you have to think about is captions for a video. And this is the one where most people's heads start spinning. Um, and mine, mine too, because it used to be that captions were hideously hard to make, and now they're only hard. Um, <laughs> YouTube has helped us. It hasn't solved the problem completely. But um, if you're going to meet the legal requirements and if you're going to actually meet the human requirements, especially for people with, low, with hearing disabilities, you need not just a transcript, but a synchronized transcript. Um, and, but if you think about a lot of the things we do, when the president makes a speech, he is not extemporizing. Maybe a little bit. But mostly he's reading from something. If you're making a training video, you're probably reading from something. And that gives you the beginnings of that transcript. They're not even that expensive to have transcribed. And it turns out that with YouTube, if you don't care about quality that much, you can fling that transcript at it, and you will get, and it will match it up. It's really bad at doing speech to text, but it's not so bad at matching text to speech. And if you don't care about perfect sync, you can do that. And then if you do care, you can go through the painful process of actually tweaking the code so it works properly. But there's some huge benefits here for SEO, for search engine optimization. There's huge benefits for people like to scan. One of the nice ones, and I, and I just went to look at this page, and it's not like this anymore. <laughs> but this was from Microsoft Research, and they have a series of lectures. And this was from Graham Poland, who did write a lovely book called Design Meets Disability. And it was a three-pane interface. We had a video of Graham. 
we had his slides, and we had his transcript. And this is highlighted blue. I could scan through the transcript, and when I clicked on it, it would jump everything to synchronize with it. And it was awesome, because I could use my ability to read fast, either visually or through ears, to find the thing I wanted. So I could, it just, it was, it was, it was great. So, last bit. Um, the last one, and I, and I, we always tend to stop here. Oh, there's all these requirements, all these things you have to do. But I think getting to mere conformance is so unsatisfying. I mean, it's always a lot of work. Where I want to get to is I want to get to a site that is universally usable, that creates delight, that helps people flow through their tasks. And there's no reason not to do that for everyone. Um, if we remove, if, let's get rid of the barriers. I mean, you've got to get rid of the stuff that stops people dead in their tracks. But once you've done that, we could go one more step by anticipating what people need and unobtrusively providing support. Um, this is a picture from Simple. It's, a, it's one of the first um, mixed media banks. It works on your cell phone, and it has a credit card. It does all this stuff. But signing up for it is a torment. It's a, it's a week-long process because you sign up, and then they send you a card, and you've got to connect your phone, and you've got all this stuff going. And they do this wonderful job of just guiding you right through it. They have all kinds of very carefully constructed work. All that work went into making sure that you don't go, ah, forget it, and leave. Right? And that's what you're trying to prevent. You're trying to prevent someone from saying, I want to read about you know, what's happening in the world today. And I come to your news site, and it's too hard to use. I'll forget about it. I'll go somewhere else. I'm looking for a place to book travel, to shop, to you know, do any of the myriad things that we work on. You want your site to be so delightful that not only will people use it, they'll tell all their friends about it, right? Let's just think about a bigger world of friends. That's really all we're saying. So I think we are ready for any questions. We have about eight minutes. If anybody has questions, I would love to talk to you now or later. Yes. The beginning of the life cycle, the person has not developed based on the disabled community. They are really closely known. Yes. That's one of the big problems. It is a huge problem. So what he said was that one of the challenges is that we tend to build personas that have left out people with disabilities. And yes, we have to start thinking about that. Um, this material is all, I, I guess I get to say this out loud in a, in a UPA presentation. Um, this fall I have a book coming out with Sarah Horton called The Web for Everyone. It, it covers this material and more. But one of the things that we did, the very first thing we did was build a set of personas and to think about what the range of disabilities were. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you need disabilities for your product to cover that range of disabilities, but you might have a persona who's got a kid in a carriage. And you might have a persona who's very weak eyes and left their glasses at home. I mean, I'm now legally blind. Right? You might have a persona who just doesn't, who's a little older and doesn't hear well. So you can begin to build some of those in. And we we spent a long time talking about where our, our persona should be. Kel Smith has a book called Digital Outcasts that looks at the fringes. He looks at the people who are really still being left out of technology and society. But I'm actually thinking about the middle percentage right here, which is the huge number of people who through um, our improved medical systems, our improved social systems, and our improved technology are living independent lives and who use technology and who use the web, right? Because if I'm designing a web application, um, there are other ways to buy things, maybe. Um, I'm talking about people who are on the web, and I want to make sure that anybody who wants to be on the web can be included. But um, so, you know, our, our person who's deaf is a graphic artist. Our, our person, you know, we have, we have someone who's a teacher. We have someone who's a nurse. We have someone who works in a legal office. Um, and you might think about what, um, what I would call situational disabilities, what everyday disabilities might get wrapped into your pers personas to help help us remember the need to expand. And you also might think about how to bring some people with disabilities into your research, either by opening up your recruiting or by actively recruiting people to make sure that, they're, that they are front and center in our mind. The whole goal of personas is to give our users a place at the table. Let's give them all a place at the table. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Um, this might be opening up another Worms, but do you have any tips for convincing stakeholders of that extra time that it does take to build this in? 
Do I have any tips from ticket holders? This is, is this like the default, this is a default question of any usability presentation, <laughs> isn't it? How do we get them to pay attention to this wonderful thing? Well, I'm kind of an incrementalist, and uh, I tend to ask permission, not forgiveness, or forgiveness, not permission. Um, I tend to do a little bit uh, and, and, and sort of show that it can happen. I might um, stage some usability work um, that showed that people who really would like to use our products can't, um, and I might think about quantifying that a bit. Um, but I would probably not come in and say, we have to upend our entire development process for this. I might think about how I'm going to start building the, the, the stones that, let that, that let, let that build up. Now, that's not a satisfying answer to everybody, but it's my answer. Well, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was going to say, depending on how competitive your industry is, if none of your competitors have done it and you've optimized, then you've got this whole segment of the population that has been left out by the competitors right. that you might be able to take right. advantage of. I think we have an invisibility problem, right? I was giving this talk at I IEEE to the conference organizers conference, and because I do over 300 conferences a year. And um, we're talking away about doing good web design, and I said, oh, by the way, you have some non-human users, and I don't mean engineers, you have screen readers and search engines. I, and at the end of the talk, I asked her questions, and a um, person at the side said, I'm so glad you included me, because I use Zoom text. I have, I have visual problems, I use Zoom text, and everybody crowded, everyone wants to come over and see my screen, and he gave everybody a demo of his, of how he, and all of a sudden, it wasn't some mythical unicorn creature out there who might one day come to their site, it's our colleague, right? So, thinking about ways to make people who have been invisible, visible, not inventing them where they don't exist, but making them visible. Back of the room. Okay, so the question is, how do you deal with people who don't read English well for a variety of reasons, either because it isn't their first language, they don't read well, they have a cognitive disability. It actually turns out a lot of reading disabilities are actually visual disabilities. Um, dyslexia, tracking on the screen, and so on, may or may not be brain, they may not be cognitive brain function, they may be visual brain function. Um, I actually think that plain language is your first step. Um, it will not take you 100% of the way there, but it will take you a long, long, long way. And by plain language, I include the plain presentation of information. So making sure that the text is, the default text is big enough and it's possible to make it bigger. That there's enough line spacing. Um, that you have headings that are written in, in clear words. That you've thought about the terminology of your user. You've done all of the plain language stuff. And then you might think about things. There is a requirement at the AAA level of WCAG for what's called a simplified summary. And I think that simplified summary is the extract. You know on Word, WordPress where you have a little 25 word extract? Something that says, this thing you're about to read, here's what it tells you in 25 to 50 words. That, if you can write that, half the time you've discovered how to write the rest of it better. Um, but to think about how you can be clearer about it. I have a whole presentation on content as accessibility. It's on SlideShare. Um, I invite you to go to that. But I do think that, that just getting to basic plain language, and by the way, if you're in the United States and a couple of other countries around the world, um, there are plain language regulations um, for government content. In South Africa, it actually applies to business content in general. Um, it's been a big upheaval, um, making sure that things that you expect customers to know, like your terms of service, warning labels, medical labels, how to do things so you don't blow your house up, all those sorts of nice things <laughs> that people actually can follow directions and that they can follow directions whether they read really proficiently or whether they read quickly. One of the corollary benefits of plain language is uh, I did a lot of work with the National Cancer Institute, so I, oncologists were part of my audience. And um, we have, they have these things called the treatment summaries, which are the sort of uh, very academic medical statements of what, um, what treatments are approved for use and what the current state of the science is. And they're written in semicolon style, academic journal style. And the woman in charge of them wanted to try to lighten them up because what we discovered was that, that high-end, you know, people, advanced, advanced patients were using these and we wanted to make them easier. And she wanted to use bullets. So instead of saying there are five clinical trials, semicolon, 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 maybe we could have a list. 
and she was very nervous that the medical profession would not see this as serious enough if we did this. And so we put a prototype together, and we brought some doctors in to test it, and they said, oh, thank God, NCI's invented the bullet. <laughs> right, right? Because, sure, they could read it, they can, they can read it, but they have 15 minutes a patient. How much time do you think they have to read stuff? Right? So it let them, it let people who struggled with medical language read at all, it let people who were getting proficient with medical language read better, and it let advanced professionals read fast. So it, ra it raised all boats. So that's where I think you start. Um, if you're interested, there's an interesting project in the UK called Easy Read, where the government has made great efforts to make sure that things like benefits information are, in fact, written in a way that there's a summary version that is, that is accessible for people with very, very low literacy. And it's, a, and it's an excellent model. Are we there? We are probably there. So please, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you think about it. I hope you take it to heart. And we come back next year, and we're all talking about how accessible we've made our, our, um, our, our, our products. Um, fill out the evaluation forms. I am very curious. This is the first of a series. You know, I expect to be talking about this for a while, but it's the first time we put it together like this. So I really would like your comments about what worked and what didn't work for you. So thank you very much. Hope you have a great rest of the conference.